come on. But we are delighted that you are with us. We have folks from all across the uh, Holston Conference, and I know we've got a couple of friends from the Tennessee Conference. So we are delighted you were here with us, and there may be folks from other places <laughs> beyond Holston Conference that I'm not aware of. But uh, we are glad you're here. Laura McLean, who uh, is Associate Director for uh, uh, for the annual conference and for youth and young adult ministries. And I am Susan Grace Close, Associate Director of Connectional Ministry for Discipleship. And we have wanted to put together this training for quite a while. And I know many of uh, several of you had requested the training. So we are glad that we were able to partner with Harmony Family Services to provide this training for us. As you know, it will be a three-part session uh, every other week, and you are most welcome to join us at this same link uh, for the next uh, two other sessions, but we will also be continuing registration and sending out the link for those who might want to join uh, just on a one or two, the second or third session on its own. We are also recording these, so they will be available for your future use, future reference if needed. You can contact Laura or myself with that. We are delighted to have Keith Bailey and Sanad Dottery with us today. Uh, and I, Sanad, I'm sorry, I may have butchered your name, so I apologize for that. But, um, but let us begin with the word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to both of them. Let us pray. A holy and gracious God, we come into your presence knowing that you surround us with your love and your care. We care for children and teenagers and families that come from very difficult situations. And we know that we have all had effects from dealing with this pandemic. Lives can be traumatized. Lives can be turned upside down and we as Faith leaders don't even know how to respond at times. Our methods that we have used in the past no longer work in these situations. We're grateful for Sanad and Keith who can share insights with us, provide us with information and knowledge as we continue to be in ministry with families in our communities. Undergird us in this time, instill us with wisdom and insight, bless us so that we can be your hands and feet in the community. In your holy name we pray, amen. Pass it off to you. All right. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. I was telling uh, Susan and Lauren, I feel like a Wayne's World episode. I'm coming to you live from my basement in Bainbury, Tennessee, in Bainbury's uh, little community between White Pine and Newport. And you have mine and Sinead's uh, bios there, and you can read those and read about the other folks who are going to be uh, presenting this series to you along the way. Um, Sinead is going to jump in and help out with some polling and then she's going to take over and um, do a part of the training. But Sinead is in youth ministry uh, in the Episcopal Church in Knoxville. And Sinead, will you tell us which church that is in Knoxville? Yes, um, so I am entering into year six as the part-time youth minister at Church of the Good Samaritan. We're in Cedar Bluff, um, and so I have been doing that officially for six years and unofficially a lot longer than that, um, and so I'm really excited to be with you all because I think you are my people as well. 
Good. Thank you, Shanae. Uh, and uh, it was exciting for me to see some people I'm familiar with. Uh, I was at uh, Holston Home for Children for 15 years and served in various positions there. And so Carol Wilson had signed up and I knew Carol from way back when I started at uh, <laughs> Wesleyan when it was college and not university and uh, Paula Sandoval and uh, saw some folks from Asbury in Greenville, Tennessee, where I lived there. My family was associated with Asbury. And I don't know Purple Pastor Pat, but I would love to hang out with you just because of your email name there. Uh, sounds fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I was actually talking with Laura, trying to get some resources for Harmony. We have a camp out in Maryville, and I needed to find out some things about um, some training you all do and, and some things you do with, with the Holston Conference camps. And uh, as we were talking, I said, oh, you know, by the way, we, we're offering this training uh, to schools and, and faith communities and to professionals all over. And would you be interested in, and with her work and Susan's work, we've been able to put this together. Um, so as you know, this is going to be a three part series where we're going to look at adverse childhood experiences and just some of the basics of, uh, kind of the, the theory and the foundation of what trauma does to our brains and bodies and our beings across time and how the faith community can respond. And then uh, we're really gonna get into the specifics of how do you take this information and start to use it in not only your individual relationships, but also your programming um, in two weeks. Um, Allison Douglas is going to lead a session on trauma responsive programming and approaches in children and youth ministry. And then Sinead and another one of our therapists, uh, Kendall Akers, will come back for the third session and talk about uh, how do we find appropriate community and clinical resources when it just gets outside the scope of what we can do as a faith community? Uh, how do we help families find the services that uh, are going to meet their needs? I want to tell you just a little bit about Harmony um, before we get started, because there may be some other resources that we have that you all may be interested in. Harmony started out in 1996 as an adoption and adoption support agency. Uh, we've grown and diversified since then, but our main focus is still working with adopted families. And the main families we work with are families who've adopted children out of the child welfare system. So these are kids who come um, with a lot of challenges. They come from difficult places. Uh, they're good loving homes they end up in but even a good, loving, structured home doesn't make all the past go away and all the, um, the aspects of trauma go away. And so our agency and our therapists, and Sinead is one of those, go into homes and work with families and kids um, to have just as healthy of relationships as they can. Um, we also do a lot of training. Um, we have a team that trains all the level one foster parents across the state of Tennessee. Uh, so we work in partnership with the Department of Children's Services uh, to do that training. We train professionals. Uh, we've trained several school systems on trauma and adverse childhood experiences. And um, we do trainings at local conferences, state conferences, national conferences. And uh, we also have the opportunity to present our work at international conferences as well. And uh, as you see in the circles there at the bottom, we do uh, some complementary and, and non-traditional therapeutic techniques that go along with our evidence-based techniques and our understanding of trauma. Um, so we use our camp for adventure-based therapy. We have a herd of horses and a pack of dogs, and they're uh, horses that we use in equine therapy and we have dogs we use in animal assisted therapy. Um, we use therapeutic yoga and drumming. And one of the things that makes our approach really unique in how we deal with trauma is that um, we really work on the somatic side, the, the way trauma affects the body and brain development. And also we work on attachment. 
Uh, now, our therapists are trained to do the emotional work and the cognitive behavioral work as well. But some of the research we're going to be presenting here uh, on adverse childhood experiences shows that uh, it's not just the memory in the mind and the behavior that's affected, it's truly the whole body and the whole being and that impacts relationships. So our staff focused on that and thought it would be a, a really nice thing to pass on to you all as well. And we also have a beautiful camp uh, out near Maryville, Tennessee, Camp Montvale. Uh, we do all sorts of things out there. That's where our horses are. Um, we have therapeutic day camps and Sinead has been in charge of those. Uh, so she ran two uh, week-long day camps, uh, which was challenging but effective even in uh, the time of COVID-19. So we have kids who come out there that sometimes aren't able to be successful in other camp settings, sometimes even church camps. Uh, and because of our approach, uh, they, um, they tend to be successful and get the benefits of a traditional camp experience. And we have camps for um, adoptive families and grandparents as well who are raising their kids. And Sinead is very involved in that. Um, one other thing before we get into the nitty gritty of the content is I, I put in the write up on this that, that Harmony is seen as a leader in trauma responsive care in Tennessee. And um, we were involved in a five year federally funded research project that came out of the Children's Bureau in Washington. And they wanted to look at all aspects of adoption. So they asked us and, us and seven other sites across the country to participate in this. And this is where we got introduced to this really deep dive into trauma um, through what's called the NMT. And I'll explain more about that later. So we just came out of that five-year research project and were able to make uh, connections with some national leaders in the field on trauma and, um, and work alongside them to further some of this information. So we were very excited about that opportunity and all that it has brought about. Um, this is something that's gonna be maybe a bit of fun, a bit awkward uh, since we're doing it online, but since you're at home or in an office, you can hopefully laugh at yourself as you do this. So uh, I tell people I, I'm gonna wow them with some brain science. So I'm gonna ask you if you're up for this challenge to put one finger out on one hand and one thumb up on the other hand. And then I want you to see how quickly you can move back and forth. So you always want a thumb up on one hand and a finger out on the other and see if you can switch back and forth there. We don't want Pointers, we don't want this guy, no guns, no nubs. So you're always trying to keep a uh, finger out on one hand and thumb up on the other hand. Now, what I ask people to do when we're in live face-to-face -face training is to find a partner and have a friendly competition and see who can do this the quickest, the most efficiently uh, before you make a mistake. And uh, usually people are just laughing, feeling awkward. Um, we get the giggles and we go on from there. But there's some interesting brain science behind this. So this finger on my left hand is operated on the right side of my brain. And this thumb on my right hand is operated on the left side of my brain. And just switching back and forth makes me cross that center line in my brain and it opens up the brain more because it creates more connections across that midline of the brain. Two, when we do this with each other, even online, when you're watching somebody do it, it causes mirror neurons in the front of the brain to fire. Mirror neurons is what causes us to watch other people and model their behavior. They model it and we try to do what they're doing. And it helps us to be social beings. We see people do things, we hear people say things, and if it's acceptable in the community, we keep doing that. If we start laughing at ourselves or at others in this, 
It actually reduces the amount of cortisol in our body. So it reduces that stress hormone. And lastly, if we're in a group doing this with like-minded people, people we feel comfortable and safe with, it actually releases a little bit of oxytocin, which is the attachment uh, neurotransmitter that helps us feel attached, connected. You have a big release of that if you have a baby and you feel that connection and attachment there. And when you're in healthy, loving relationships, you release oxytocin there. And so just this simple little exercise has a lot of connections to our brain and our science is saying, just by doing something this simple and fun and silly and doing it in community, it can have some positive impacts on our brain and our body. So we're gonna take that and kind of expand it out to help us understand um, what does trauma and stress do to our brains and our body? What do they do uh, to children? How does it negatively impact them? And then over this course of three sessions, we're gonna start building on, now that we know this, what can we do as individuals and faith communities to help people find healing and, and restoration for that? Um, I'm gonna ask a question, I'm gonna ask you to respond in the chat box if you feel comfortable doing that, and Sinead is gonna monitor that. Uh, how many of you have heard of ACES before this opportunity was offered through the Holston Conference? And Sinead, if you'll just kind of scan through there, and uh, we have 39 people on. You don't have to do a count, but you can say majority or... Lots of yeses. Lots of yeses, good. A so couple the of no's. question is, um, how many of you have had formal training? on ACEs, either through Tennessee's Building Strong Brains or through other opportunities? Mm. Yes for training, no you haven't. Lots of no training. Okay. So lots of people know about it, maybe not as many have done sort of formal training. All right, well that's why we're here is to uh, take that next step so uh, you start to flesh some of this out. and. If you have any questions along the way, please put those in the chat box. And if it's something we may get to, uh, Sinead may let it just uh, sit there uh, till we get to that section and may bring it up. It may be something that we talk about at the very end. And then um, we should finish this up in about an hour or so. And if some of you are able to and want to stay on and have a live chat, about some of your questions, we'd be happy to do that along the way. So we want you to ask questions and we'll, we'll build that in. Along the way, let's handle it through the chat box. Uh, that may be the easiest way to do that. So Tennessee uh, developed a curriculum probably three or four years ago called Building Strong Brains. And it's actually, in my opinion, one of the best in the nation. They had a multi-million dollar grant um, through the Tennessee um, or Commission for Children and Youth to develop this curriculum. And they uh, talked with national experts and got national resources, such as from the Harvard Center for the Developing Child. And they e even talked to a messaging firm of how do we get this information out the best way possible to people and developed a training that can be either 15 minutes long or three hours long. So you can give it at lunch to the Kiwanis Club uh, to help them learn more about the economic impact of adverse childhood experiences. Or you could do a three-hour training that helps a, a clinical group uh, understand more about adverse childhood experiences. But one thing I really like about what they did in this is they didn't start with trauma. They, they started with stress and put this on a continuum from positive stress through tolerable stress all the way to what's called toxic stress or trauma. So you see in the graphic there, positive stress can be anything like meeting new people, going on vacation to uh, a new place. I tell teachers all the time, we send kids to you so that you can stress them the right way at the right amount at their developmental level that's appropriate. 
so that their bodies and brains can grow and they can learn more and use the knowledge. And then tolerable stress, the example that they give here is something like a death in the family. And you see the graphs below that shows the stress causes uh, a change in our, our body and our brain and our emotions and changes our very lives. And um, you see with positive stress, it drops down pretty quickly to, to what's kind of normal for us. And tolerable stress, you see it takes a little bit longer. And then with toxic stress, um, it can take a long time, if ever that life gets back to normal for folks. And we wanna talk about how we can help people get back to normal and healthy and joyful living um, through the community. So the adverse childhood experience study was actually done in the mid 1990s. And a researcher uh, out of California joined up with a researcher from the CDC in Atlanta to look at how can we prevent health issues, mental health issues, and increase positive life outcomes? And in looking at this, they wanted to see, first of all, what happens in childhood that may cause health issues, mental health issues, and negative life outcomes. And so they came up with 10 adverse childhood experiences. So you can see how they're categorized here under abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. So under abuse, you have physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. Neglect is physical neglect, emotional neglect. And then under household dysfunction, there's quite a range there. Everything from um, living with someone who has mental illness, that could be a parent or another sibling, or somebody in the immediate family or close family who is incarcerated uh, is difficult for children. Uh, if mother is treated violently, if there's domestic abuse of any type in the home, if you're living in a home with somebody who um, is abusing a substance, and if you lose a parent in any way, but the primary way they found that, that kids lose parents and lose that connection is through divorce. So they asked 17,000 adults have these 10 things happened to you often or very often in your lifetime? So one at a time they asked, and if you said, yes, this happened often or very often, you got a one. And if you said, no, it did not happen often or very often, you got a zero. So you could have a score from zero to 10. None of these 10 things happened to me or 10, all 10 of these things happened. So you could get that range from zero to 10. And what they found was in short that the higher number of ACEs you had, the more likelihood you were to have health issues, mental health issues, and have negative life outcomes. And when they were talking about negative life outcomes or lack of potential, they looked at things like, um, did you graduate from high school? Uh, did you get a job? Did you go on for more uh, education or training? Can you hold a job? Did you show up for your job? Those sorts of life achievement things uh, that help people be, be successful and self-sustaining in the community. However, you all as professionals who work with kids and families know that these are not the only 10 things that negatively impact kids. So I'm gonna ask you all to respond via the chat. Um, what are some other things that if you were doing this survey today, this research project, you would add to this list as a measure of things that can negatively impact kids both in their childhood and maybe later in life. And Sinead's gonna look at your responses there and read some of them out see if we have things. Hunger, mental illness, school bullying, mm -hmm. immigration and deportation, poverty, the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. yes, serious illnesses. Um, spot on, we could go on and on and on. Um, natural disasters. Social isolation is another. Yeah, that's a good one. Now. 
a pandemic, which they weren't thinking of in the mid 1990s when they put this together. And so we could take this, these 10 things and probably add another 10 or 20 things to them uh, that we know can have a negative impact on children, both in their childhood and can be lifelong issues. Um, and we'll look at some of the data that um, they found in the study. But the reason I asked the question was I wanted us to look at how complex this can be. Um, it would be nice if these were the only 10 things uh, that negatively impacted kids and, and we would have maybe a better chance at, um, at mitigating or lessening the impact of these things. But as you all pointed out, there's more and more of those things. And it's not just what we call these 10 big T traumas or national uh, disasters. Um, they're the small tolerable stresses that build up those multiple losses over time. The bullying, the community violence, uh, the things that move from being tolerable stress to intolerable, uh, the institutionalized racism, uh, the community violence, the poverty that people live in. Didn't make that 10 big T trauma list, but we certainly consider those as trauma that builds over time. So. When we're thinking about ACEs, we need to think about it as this study that was done in the 90s that showed us that what happens to kids, especially the negative things that happen to kids, can have a lifelong impact on them, on their health, their mental health, and their life potential if we don't intervene and if they don't have the resources that they need. So it gets even more complex because since that time, we started looking at other things, other factors that impact uh, people's lives, um, not just from early childhood, but also from their neighborhood and from their history as well. So this graphic comes from the RISE Center uh, out in California. And if you go from that complex trauma ACE at the base of the pyramid and take a step below that, it shows that social conditions, we mentioned community violence, lack of resources in a community, or kids living in a, a food desert or a resource desert as far as um, you know, safe and healthy places to play, medical care, are their schools real, well resourced? And there are some people who are saying, um, that is not just your, your genetic code that will let you know how you're going to be affected by trauma. Sometimes it can be your zip code. It's where you live and the resources you have to mitigate or lessen these traumas that can be an indication of how severely um, they may have an impact on your life. And then it gets even more complex because it can go down to a genetic and historical communal issue of how the community has been impacted by trauma. And we're living that out in our country right now with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it's not just the deaths that have happened recently, it's the history of trauma uh, that that community has lived through for over 400 years in our community. And now there's research that shows it's not just the maybe the lack of resources, or uh, the racism that some communities have experienced because of racism and trauma, it literally affects the genetics of certain communities. So we know, for instance, that the, in the black community, there's more diabetes, higher blood pressure rates, uh, more heart disease, more kidney disease, more obesity. And part of that is the, the poverty and the lack of resources. Um, that some folks have lived in in these communities for hundreds of years, but also we know that stress and big T trauma and small T trauma literally changes the body and the genetics over time. And that some of these genetic expressions are passed on from generation to generation. So that just really adds to the complexity of the ACEs study.
Now back to the original study, something I didn't tell you about the participants. There were 17,000 participants who were predominantly white, predominantly college educated, and they all had insurance. And even in this group, they found, as I said, the higher number of ACEs produced more health issues, uh, more mental health issues, more at-risk behaviors, such as smoking, alcoholism, and drug use, and lower life potential there. There were 41 or more negative outcomes associated with higher ACEs scores. One of the most astonishing things that was found in this study was that people who had six or more ACEs had a life expectancy on average of 20 years less. Back to the genetic side, we know that aging and stress change your genetics. Uh, it changes the way the chromosomes replicate and they have found that children who live with more stress actually have shorter chromosomes in their cells. So when our body replicates every cell, it's almost as if uh, those children have prematurely aged uh, because of the stress and trauma that they have faced. This is uh, a modern replication of the ACEs study that was done in Iowa. And you see um, some ratio outcomes here. If you have no ACEs, one to three ACEs, or four or more ACEs, what the likelihood is of these at-risk behaviors or heart disease. But the one on the bottom is something that we need to give attention to is the suicide rate, because we know that across almost every community and every age demographic in America, the suicide rate is rising. And um, it's something that we need to attend to at the relational level one-on-one, -on -one, and we need to attend to in the community level, and certainly uh, as a faith community. And the, the last part of the bad news is that um, it's been found that the stress and the big T traumas and the small T traumas affect not just general health, but can affect some very, very specific uh, functions of the body. Everything from heart disease to gastrointestinal problems, we mentioned um, high blood pressure. Um, it just affects every part of who we are. And recently, our clinical approach to this has been to take people who've been traumatized and put them in clinical settings and say, let's think about this. And yes, trauma impacts the brain and the mind and behavior and choices, but we're seeing that it goes a lot deeper. It, it affects the body and it affects the body development and it affects the brain development. And it's much more complex. Um, but some of the good news is there, there are some really simple approaches to help people with healing. And the good news for the faith community and the churches are you all know what to do. Uh, you've been doing it for over 2,000 years. It's been your mission and your ministry. Uh, and so what we're hoping to give uh, built upon this knowledge is with some information and maybe reframing the understanding of the impact of stress and trauma and retooling some of the resources and um, being intentional in some new ways about how we interact with people and how we view the impact of trauma uh, that we can even have a more positive impact in people's lives. So here's some things that the ACE study did not tell us. It didn't tell us uh, the timing of the trauma, the duration of the trauma. Did you experience a once-off natural disaster? Did you experience a pandemic for six months? Or have you experienced abuse or neglect for your entire life? We know that the duration, the intensity, and the relationship of where the trauma came from is important. Uh, we know that some children are more susceptible than others. Some of us are just wired differently. Uh, to deal with some of the negative impacts. The good news we have found since this study is that adults can be a buffer, communities can be a buffer. 
the, the impact of trauma. There is the capacity to repair um, some of the impacts of trauma over time and interventions definitely do make a difference. So one thing uh, we always do to caution people is now that you know about the ACEs study and these 10 questions, um, we suggest that you don't use it as a diagnostic tool. And we're finding this is happening in schools and in other state programs and community programs. They want to give everybody the ACEs score so they know if the kids are threes or fives or sevens or tens. And what we're finding out about trauma, as I said, is this doesn't tell us the whole story. It doesn't tell us about the duration and the timing. The earlier the trauma, the more detrimental it is. The fewer the positive relationships and community resources, the more detrimental uh, the trauma is. And there are kids who have a score of five or six or maybe even seven who experience those traumas later in life who aren't going to have the negative impacts of a kid who has a three and who has lived with that trauma since birth or even experienced trauma in utero when mom was pregnant with the child. So um, it's extremely complex in the brain science and in the outcomes, but the good news that you're gonna hear in the next three sessions is that basically healing comes through healthy relationships. Uh, and Sinead is gonna go into detail about that. So uh, in the midst of this, whether we're neuroscientists or clinicians, or youth ministers or children ministry leaders or pastors or volunteers, just a resiliency approach, a relational approach that understands uh, what people's lives have experienced and how it's impacted them that's gonna help us um, to navigate their needs. So this study has really helped shift the conversation from, hey, what's wrong with you health-wise, mental health-wise, some of the choices people are making to what's happened to you. If we understand what happened and we reframe the impact of what happened, we retool our approach to ministry and relationships. So this is where ACEs leads, leads off, and this is where in the state of Tennessee, the training stops. There's some general things we need to do better in schools and early childhood and that sort of thing that we've known that for 20 or 30 years. Um, what Harmony was able to get into was uh, this horribly titled thing called the Neurosequential Model of Therapeutics, which basically says we've got to understand how the brain works, how the body works, how experiences affect that. And what to do for each individual because the approach has to be individualized for people. And this method has been modified to use not just in clinical settings, but in schools for foster parents, adoptive parents, early childhood settings, and there's even a sports component, uh, which is great to know for upward basketball or in Knoxville, the Emerald Youth Foundation, how to approach kids who come from maybe some challenging circumstances and minister to them even through sports. So this approach is really based upon biology and neurology, but again, it comes down to how do we bring healing through relationships? Uh, the person who has been developing this over 30 years is Dr. Bruce Perry. He's a child psychiatrist, he's a neuroscientist, and you can see um, the involvement he's had, sadly, at some of these national tragedies. And uh, he has been looking at the brain and our research on the brain and our therapeutic interventions and over 30 years said, if we know the brain works this way, we need to intervene this way with that knowledge basis. Um, he trained us at Harmony and uh, he lives in Chattanooga now. He has lived in Canada and Texas, and he's an active grandfather and puts his money where his mouth is and is involved as an active part of his family and his community. And if that were not cool enough, all his accolades, he hangs out with Oprah uh, and 
I think has written a book with her that will be coming out soon. And his original book, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, kind of takes some cases of kids and puts some of this knowledge alongside of it and is very readable and, and fleshes this information out. So he helps us to understand that trauma changes the body over time, that stress um, literally changes the body. And when I do this training for teachers, I often say, um, you know, that kid who the least little thing sets him off and he goes from zero to 60 in the classroom or during your program, he didn't walk into your classroom at zero because of the stress um, that he has lived under. His body is revved up, his body is jacked up, his emotions may be jacked up. And he walked into your classroom or he walked into your Sunday school class or your youth group at 30 or 40 already. Um, and yes, may be reactive to what we consider to be small things. On the other side of this, um, we have to look at the impact of neglect on kids and their development and how they organize not only their thoughts, but their relationships and how they navigate the world. And this is a classic picture that Dr. Perry has used in his research and teaching. Uh, and don't pay as much attention to the size difference between the, the two children um, as you do the, the prominence of the black gaps in brain development um, there for the child who's experienced extreme neglect. And there are times we think kids who come from uh, backgrounds of neglect, if they go into foster homes or if they go into adoptive homes, that um, they get their needs met and all the impact of that former neglect goes away. And that's just not the case. It can help to make up for that and start to move them forward in the right direction. But there's lots of deficits there that we have to be aware of as we move forward in supporting them. Uh, you may hear an unhappy little dog in the background who got banished to the bedroom uh, during this time. So um, what we tend to see with kids, whether they're in schools or the community or our youth meetings is kids who've had high stress and trauma may be what's called hyper aroused with big emotions and big reactions and a hard time concentrating. And that takes up some time and energy um, to meet their needs and uh, to help them to attend to what's going on and maybe not take away from the other kids who are attending. I know that takes uh, time and energy, but there's another side of this as well as those kids who dissociate because of neglect or trauma. It's the opposite reaction. These are the kids you may see in your programming who just check out. And this is a picture of a girl at school and she was handed homework and it was stressful for her and she just kind of shut down and looked like she's asleep. And she may be deemed as disrespectful, unattentive. Um, sadly, I still hear the word lazy. It's a kid who doesn't care about her future. She doesn't want to achieve. But we don't know what happened to her in the hallway before this. We don't know what happened to her on the bus ride to school. We don't know what happened to her the night before. She lived in a home with domestic violence and experienced that. And in fact, this may be what her life has been like as a child. And this is her way of coping, not to have the big fight or flight reaction to back everybody off or to get a lot of energy out. But her way of coping was when I get stressed, when negative things happen, when I can't handle something, I just start to shut down and check out. And sadly, uh, we find that a lot of kids who experience high levels of stress and trauma get multiple diagnoses. And sometimes the parents and your foster parents who have kids in your programs may tell you this litany of diagnoses and maybe even the meds that kids are on. And kids may also uh, self-harm. But we also hear that um, you know, it goes beyond this. It's not just a clinical diagnosis, which may really go back to these kids are traumatized and what they're doing through their behavior is they're surviving 
in the world the best they know how. Uh, but we hear the judgments. Uh, this is a disrespectful kid. This is a disobedient kid. This is a bad kid or they have bad parents with bad boundaries. Uh, and sadly for teenagers, I hear people say, this is a kid who's not making good moral choices. This is a kid who needs to work on his faith or discipleship, his walk with God. And I promise you, we still hear this kid has a demon. And it's the work of Satan in this kid's life. Uh, so we have everything from these clinical diagnoses to our moral judgments of what's going on. And sometimes when we look deep enough back, into the history of the kid, it can be stress and trauma. So we may need to reframe. And as Allison Douglas, who you're going to hear from uh, later, uh, says, you know, we don't have to be trauma detectives. We don't have to be clinicians. We just need to be aware if a kid who's come from a challenging uh, background and to reframe what that behavior may mean. And um, so we move the conversation to this next step of instead of what's wrong with you to what happened to you, that now we understand what happened to you, how can we help you to regulate, feel comfortable in your body, in my presence and in my program and in my church and in my community? How can I establish healthy and safe relationships, and then how does that lead to reasoning and reflecting and maybe even reflecting upon uh, faith development and choices and moving forward. And again, to uh, quote Allison Douglas, uh, this approach is good for all kids, and it's absolutely necessary for those kids who come from high trauma and stress backgrounds. And I will say, this approach, this resiliency, relational approach works with kids who haven't had the trauma background, who truly have those genetic organic reasons for their ADHD or their depression or their anxiety. Um, no matter where it comes from, if we understand that their behavior is a manifestation of them being in a challenging place, it helps us to navigate uh, into healthy relationships and healthy opportunities for them in healthy communities. So Sinead, uh, who's one of our therapists and, and works with families through Harmony, is going to go on and talk in more detail about these healing relationships. Yes, um, thank you, Keith. So just um, a little background on me again, because I know some of you joined in late. Um, I am a family therapist with Harmony, and then I'm also um, on year six of doing part-time youth ministry at an Episcopal church in Knoxville. Um, so I'm coming at this with kind of two different perspectives. So when we're thinking about trauma, um, and specifically thinking about therapeutic interventions, um, ways to help, um, the goal of therapy is really to build new associations, new memories, new brain patterns. Um, and we often think this kind of erases or takes away the bad things or the things that had happened in the past. Um, and I wish that was true, but it's not. Um, and so it rewires the brain around those things and it lessens the impact of those memories. Um, but those are still present. Um, and so I often hear the kids that I work with um, talk about being triggered. So I was triggered by this thing. I'm sure you all hear that, especially if you're with middle schoolers or high schoolers. Um, I think that word gets overused, um, but there is something to that. So when we hear or smell or see or feel a certain sensation, um, it can quickly bring back those old memories and brain patterns from uh, times of stress and trauma. And so the goal of therapy is definitely to lessen those, um, but it does not completely eliminate them. And so we want to be mindful of that and respectful of that when we are working with um, individuals and children and youth who have um, those trauma histories. And so 
the best way that therapy rewires the brain is really through patterned repetitive activation of that system. So not sitting and talking about what happened, um, not a one-time thing, but an ongoing patterned repetitive practice that really tells our brain and our body that we are safe um, and that things are different now. And so part of that we'll talk about in a minute is really how um, we as a church community can um, impact these people's lives. And so relationship is the primary way that we provide therapeutic change for people. The relationship with a therapist is often more powerful than the specific type of therapy being done. Um, because if we have had trauma in a relationship, um, someone has harmed us or scared us or something bad has happened, um, it takes healthy relationships to rewire the brain and to tell us that we can trust people and that people are safe and that we can be in relationship with others and really feel comfortable. Um, and the good news about this is you don't have to be a therapist to provide therapeutic relationships. Um, I think churches are very uniquely situated to really provide a lot of these healing relationships. Um, those of you who are youth ministers, you probably have had lots of those interactions with um, the youth that you serve and children as well. Just those conversations and that showing up for the kid again and again um, is really powerful. And so as we're doing that, we can do it with the intention that we're providing a very therapeutic sort of a relationship, that this is um, helping them towards healing just by being present with them, um, even when they're not being pleasant. And so Keith talked a little bit earlier about being um, hypo aroused and hyper aroused. Um, so when we are not feeling calm and not feeling good in our bodies um, and we start to maybe escalate. Um, so I often think about the content on this slide when I think about some of my adult volunteers that I work with. Um, so picturing some of my children and youth who Maybe they start to get a little loud, they're getting a little unruly, and what does the adult do? They also start to get a little louder and a little bigger. And so the child just meets them, and now we've got this sort of escalation on both the child's part and the adult's part. Um, very rarely is the adult going to win in that situation. Most of the time we just end up with two very frustrated people um, in a much bigger situation than we need. And it's so easy to slip into that pattern because when someone else is dysregulated and not feeling calm, it's very contagious. Um, we've all been there, I'm sure, um, where someone else's emotions start to come off on you and maybe you're feeling like this young person's being defiant or disrespectful, you're trying to get control back, and now here we are and you're just as upset as they are. Um, and so this is um, where co-regulation can be really, really helpful. And so that just means um, coming alongside and being calmer than the person. So when the little one starts to get loud and a little bit escalated coming in, in a very calm, slow tone. And we all have those wonderful people who are like child whisperers who can do that without even maybe thinking about it. Um, and they come in and they're very quiet and they're very calm. You can tell you're not happy what is going on here. Um, and so that is called co-regulation, and that is often exactly what our kiddos need when they are starting to get into this pattern of escalation, because it tells them, hey, I'm safe, this other person is calm, I can be where they are, and not, oh no, this other person's escalated, I need to escalate more. Um, and so if there was one thing that I would want all my adult volunteers trained with, it would be this idea of we want to go calmer than the child. We don't ever want um, to match them or escalate with them. And it's hard to do. It takes a lot of personal skills to calm yourself down in the middle of that moment and set aside your own preconceived notions of like disrespect and defiance and all of these things that feel so awful to us as adults and really say, hey, okay. I need to help this child calm down and not um, maybe take it quite as personally, which I know sometimes is hard. And let's see here. So the six R's are something that I have 
both inadvertently and on purpose shaped my youth program around and that I think are really, really helpful um, in a ministry setting. Um, so these are just elements for um, really positive, developmentally appropriate um, settings, whether it's a school or a church or any kind of youth serving program. Um, and so the first R is relevant. We've got rhythmic, repetitive, relational, rewarding, and respectful. So to have a program that really provides this re relevant um, or developmentally appropriate programming, um, we really want to know a concept of like chronological age versus developmental age. Um, so I serve a youth group um, from fourth grade through 12th grade, and I have a lot of children in my program, maybe because I'm a therapist, I'm not sure, who their chronological age, let's say they're 15, does not match their emotional or sort of developmental age. They are emotionally way behind um, a lot of mine very much so. So when they start to get stressed, they're not going to act like a 15 year old. They're going to present with behaviors much more um, typical of maybe an elementary school child, um, which can be very frustrating for adults when, you know, we're here to talk to teenagers and we're being presented with stomping feet and pouting and those sorts of things. And we're like, what is happening? Um, so if we can kind of keep in mind that for children who've experienced trauma or stress, especially early in life, they often have this lower sort of emotional maturity. Um, we can create a program and interact with them in ways that are really matched to their development. I also keep that in mind when I'm planning curriculum and when I'm planning activities. Um, I do a lot of accommodations for my kids. It's almost like a special ed classroom at some times because we'll have two or three different versions of the same lesson or activity going on. Um, so if we're doing something really loud and physical and kind of wild, I have a lot of children with autism who that is not their thing. That's overwhelming. They're in the corner. So I provide a second thing that's more developmentally matched for them. And then I might have something else going on for the kids who are very withdrawn and uncomfortable. Um, and so these are very simple ways um, that you can kind of create a program that is um, really appropriately matched for all of the children in your program. We also want to have rhythm incorporated in our program. And I know that might sound kind of strange, um, but rhythm is very calming for our brain. And when I think about churches like the Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, these sort of mainline Protestant, um, we are Rhythm is just inherent in what we do. Um, thinking about the liturgical year, right? We have this very rhythmic cycle of how scripture comes through and how we do music and how we decorate the church and all of these things. It's predictable, it's rhythmic, we know what's coming and it feels really safe. It's very calming. Um, it's why we stay and we're not in a Pentecostal denomination where that is less so, right? There's something to that that is very calming to our brain. Um, and so thinking about ways to incorporate that rhythm um, into all of your programming, right? So for my youth, our format is almost exactly the same every time they enter the space. Um, we start with the same check-ins, we do the same order of things. Does, the activities differ, but the basic structure and the rhythm of our time together is the same. So that my kids who are anxious, my kids who have autism, my kids who just get thrown off when something's different, know what to expect. That's a very simple way to keep things a little calmer and feeling a little more safe. Um, and I also incorporate actual rhythm. So we have three rules. Um, I use those rules for all of my programming because I can't remember more than that and neither can my kids. Um, so we keep it very simple. And those three rules travel with us wherever we go. We have it almost in like a sing-songy sort of a chant of what are the rules, tell me how it applies. Um, it's a really simple way to incorporate rhythm and it's going to stick in their head better because there's a little rhythm to it. So you can get very creative and what I know of church people is we are really creative as children and youth ministers and pastors um, to find ways to incorporate that rhythm into our programming. We also want things to be repetitive and that ties in very much with that rhythmic sort of I know what's coming next. Um, for my youth, we go over the rules pretty much every time they walk in the room, very briefly. We go over expectations. We constantly are saying, okay, here's what happens next. 
um, because that gives them some stability and some sort of repetition. Um, I had to laugh one time on a trip. I was not doing a good job of that. And every second I turned around, I'd had someone saying, Miss Shanae, what's next? Miss Shanae, what's next? And we had this joke about, we heard my name more than I've ever heard it in my life. I had not been providing that repetition of here's what is coming next. Um, I just wasn't organized that day and it, it showed um, in their anxiety. And so we can be prepared, we can have it written on the wall, we can remind them of what's coming next in ways that really do um, help little brains feel safer and calmer and it doesn't take a lot of extra effort on our part. Um, and then I think church is really good at the next one. So relational, um, providing those really healthy strong relationships is something that I think the church really does well um, most of the time. And so sometimes that's on purpose and intentional. Maybe it's mentoring programs or specific adults who work with your youth, but sometimes it's just those organic sort of relationships that form, you know, through volunteer programs and service programs or through older youth with younger kids. Um, but when we think back to earlier, um, relationships are really the key component to healing trauma, um, having evidence that, hey, I can be in relationship with other people and be okay and trust them and be vulnerable with them. Um, that takes time for people who have that trauma history. And so I think we can be extra intentional about how we do that and in structuring programs in ways that give kids lots of um, different people to potentially form those healthy relationships with. Um, and I think you all do like safe church or safe sanctuaries. I know we have something like that. And so you have to consider all of that. Um, but there are so many ways, even within those guidelines of really connecting youth and older adults, youth and middle-aged adults, youth and children um, to really provide a, a good range of those relationships. Um, and I'm sure you all each have your own examples of those relationships you've been able to have too um, that are so meaningful. Um, and we want what we do to be rewarding. Um, so of course we do. And I think sometimes with church programming, kids are there because someone told them to get up and go to Sunday school and they're there, right? I certainly hear that a lot. Um, and so really thinking through how can I make this particular event rewarding for this child with their needs? Um, what can we do to really connect for them? So it takes a lot of individualized planning, um, but when things are rewarding, we want to come and we want to be there. Um, and so just really thinking, especially for those kids who are disconnected and hard to get through to, what would be rewarding? Um, I actually have one little guy I'm thinking of right now and one of my adult volunteers likes the same weird card game that this kid likes and they've connected over that and all of a sudden this kid loves coming to church and loves coming to youth group but it took a while to find someone who had the same weird interest that he did and then connecting them and they're both feeling very rewarded by this um, and funny enough the adult volunteer is actually a formerly adopted child um, who also has his own trauma history and it was just kind of funny how they found each other um, but that took some, some planning. How could we make this rewarding for this little guy? And finally, we really want to be respectful. Um, and that, of course, includes being respectful of culture and values, um, the trauma history of the child. I have a lot of kids who have very specific um, sort of triggers and things that set them off. And, making sure we create an environment that's as respectful of that as we can. I never force my kids into games that involve physical contact um, or into reading out loud or sharing or anything that, you know, for them could be potentially upsetting. We certainly create the space for them to do that if they choose to. Um, but I find that a lot of the kids I work with in maybe other youth programs, maybe through their schools and things like that, Often it's very pressure based and it's very get up in front of everyone and do this silly dance. Um, and if that's just terrifying, um, then we're not creating a rewarding and respectful environment for them. So how can we engage everyone in a way that really is respectful of where they're at um, right now? So those are the six R's and I think we're really good at that. And then I just, I found this quote and I really, it sort of captured a lot for me of, of what all of this is about. So this is from Shelley Rambo in a book. 
Christians often try to move too quickly from trauma to resilience, from death to resurrection. This insistence leaves traumatized people feeling even more isolated. Rambo reminds readers to linger in a Holy Saturday frame of mind, bearing witness to what will never be the same. Just as the Christian liturgical year cycles through the same themes, people who have experienced trauma often need to repeat their stories. Entering into others' suffering builds the relationships that help them heal. So I just found that to really capture a lot of what we're getting at here and why church is such a unique place um, to be able to do this work. And so here, um, because I am both therapist and youth minister, I have sort of a different perspective on some of these things. Um, but I think sometimes it's helpful, um, if you're not a therapist, to have a clue of what are some good interventions for children, youth, um, and adults who are dealing with these things. Because I don't know about you all, but in my work, I get a lot of questions about, hey, my child needs a therapist, or hey, my child's asked for a therapist, or we're just trying to find, you know, some support. Um, and so when we're thinking about trauma, not all therapy is created equal. Um, so I always say to just kind of do your research if you are going to recommend someone, um, because what used to be considered best for trauma is maybe no longer the case. Um, and often it's some things that are a little different than what we might think of. So just a handful of different therapies that you might kind of keep an eye out for. Um, SMART is a really wonderful one, especially for those children who are just bouncing off the walls all the time um, and cannot contain their bodies. Um, TheraPlay is a really incredible intervention um, for families where there's been a disruption between the parent and the child, whether that's maybe an adoption and it's a new relationship or um, some family issues where there's been a disconnect. Um, so I always recommend TheraPlay for that. Um, EMDR is one of the most effective um, treatments for PTSD and trauma. Um, and it works on children and adults. Um, and that is kind of my first go-to for a lot of um, referrals because it's so effective. We mentioned that Harmony has equine therapy and there are several other places you can find that. Um, having that relationship with an animal is sometimes much safer um, than having a relationship with a person right off the bat. And so for a lot of very um, guarded and kids who don't really trust, um, having that animal um, can do so much therapeutically before they're ready to really talk to adults and therapists. Um, I see a question. So EMDR, that's a great question. Eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. It's one of those therapies where if you look it up, you're gonna go, oh my goodness, that sounds crazy. What is she telling me to do? Um, but I am a therapist that's trained in it and I promise it really is a powerful tool um, for PTSD from all kinds of different things, whether we're talking about veterans or um, developmental trauma or really any number of things. Um, so I do find that to be a great resource. Um, one thing I would encourage you all to look at, um, this is the framework for my entire youth program, um, is Trust-Based Relational Intervention, TBRI. Um, this really looks at are we meeting the most basic needs, um, which as churches we're often good at doing. We always have snacks and we always want people to be comfortable and those sorts of things. Um, TBRI provides a really good framework for okay. So if we're coming from trauma and we're coming from a hard place, we may need more of that kind of nurturing basic needs being met. Um, some examples from that in my program, um, we always have some snacks available and I don't monitor them. I, I really encourage the children to, if you feel hungry, you can have a snack and it's always things I'm okay with them eating. Um, but to say people who've been through trauma often need to eat more often um, to keep their blood sugar steady so that they're not having these spikes that often trigger emotional outbursts. Um, we do a lot more nurturing um, looking through the TBRI lens. Um, we connect with the child before we correct the behavior. Um, and that is hard sometimes, but that is so powerful to say, hey, I'm here with you and we're gonna figure this out together. Not, ooh, you're being bad, get out of my classroom. 
Um, so for me, TBRI has been one of the most powerful tools that I have, um, both for therapy and for ministry. Um, and they have a lot of great videos and books um, if you just Google TBRI. Um, the list in bold are some of the different therapies that we do. Um, some of them are not as traditional as maybe talk therapy, um, but often very, very helpful because they're body-based. They really get into the sensations and the triggers that come with trauma. How do I regulate my body and feel calm and feel good? Um, and a lot of those are things we do in youth ministry anyway, um, things like drumming and rhythm and movement, um, those sorts of things. Um, so sometimes you can build that in intentionally and in later trainings, we'll talk more about how to do that. And then um, down here at the bottom is cognitive behavior therapy. That's often the first thing people recommend for people who've been through trauma. It's really effective if you've had a single incident trauma, like maybe an adult in a car accident. If we're talking about a child with developmental trauma, something that's gone on and on, that is not where I would start. Um, because like we've been saying in this training, um, we have to feel calm in our body and regulated and be in relationship with others before we can talk about the hard stuff. Um, and so sometimes I think that's a helpful piece to know too, is sending someone off to talk about their trauma may not resolve it. We need those relationships and those skills before we do that. We just have some different illustrations of all of the ways that um, different activities can be therapeutic for children and youth. And then I'm gonna pass this back over to Keith for a bit. Thanks, Sinead, for the explanations that you've given about how healthy relationships are, are healing and how we can go about that. Um, Allison Douglas, who you will meet in just a few minutes, will talk about how she's going to take some of this information and start to apply it and how you um, start to inject this into your, your programming. And then you're going to hear more about uh, some of the specific uh, therapeutic techniques that we can help families find. Uh, from Kendall Acres in the last session, and Shanae will be uh, along with that session as well uh, to talk about the role of the church. Um, as Shanae mentioned, one of the prominent things we hear out in the community is cognitive behavioral therapy is the way to go, and this is the way that our um, our profession of clinical intervention is approaching this most every place, and it's one technique done by one professional, maybe one hour a week or every other week. And what we're finding in our study of how the brain develops is that that's just not enough. It's not enough dosing to change the wiring of the brain and the wiring of the body and the reestablishment of the relationship. Um, and what we're talking about here is taking a whole brain, whole body, whole community approach the healing trauma. And um, one thing that we talk about is ha at Harmony is that we've got to take this information and move it from the clinic to the community. Because as good and well-trained as Sinead and our other therapists and Allison is, um, it's just not enough of those positive interactions to bring about the healing and the rewiring of the body and the brain and of the relationships and of the being. And so it takes all of these different entities and agencies and communities and all the different individuals being on the same page with this. And I want to tell one quick story and then turn it back over to Sinead to talk more about how we need to reframe our approach in the church. Um, I talked with a mother who had a kid who was extremely anxious and he was so anxious, he would get in social situations and just shut down. He couldn't function, he couldn't do the task at hand, he couldn't communicate with people. It was so bad that she had to teach him ways to you know, appropriately remove himself and go to a place where he could find some calm you know, or find a person who was calming. Um, and she um, took the child to therapy and the therapist helped with some of these techniques and developed this technique where when he became so anxious, um, if he was with someone or in a group, he would take three step back and three deep breaths 
And so he practiced this and used it. And he took it to school with him and the mother talked with the teacher about how he needed to use this and how she may need to prompt him when she saw that he was becoming anxious to take three steps back and three deep breaths. And even if that didn't work, that he could excuse himself and go somewhere and find a calming space. So mom knew it, the therapist knew it, the teacher knew it, but the scoutmaster didn't know it. And this kid was in middle school and in scouts. And one day he was just in a group of boys and they were horsing around and the scoutmaster thought he was the ringleader of it. And so he called him out and he got in the kid's face and he literally put the finger in the face. And this kid became so anxious that he took three steps back and the scoutmaster took three steps in and the kid took three more steps back and the scoutmaster took three steps in and the kid turned to walk away to find a calm space and the scoutmaster grabs him by the shoulder and turns him around and lectures him on how disrespectful he is. Um, and that kid didn't want to go back to scouts for a long time. And that was one of the positive things in his life, one of the positive communities he was a part of. And just that understanding of what this kid was going through with anxiety and what he needed in that moment, and what hopefully he was going to progress to by being able to calm down and come back and re-engage and get the benefits and work on, you know, staying in those anxious moments longer and longer and longer um, was something everybody needed to understand. And so that hurt the relationship, it hurt his uh, desire to be in that community for a long, long time. And that's why we've all got to be on the same page. And even the church community um, has to have an understanding of this and work with all these other entities and agencies uh, to help support kids. Again, all kids need this, absolutely necessary uh, for those kids who come from backgrounds of stress. And trauma. So, Sinead, back over to you um, to talk about some of these approaches in the church community. Yes. Um, so, like I said before, I do think that, you know, churches and ministries are in a unique position to do a lot of these things and to do them well if we're all on the same page and intentional. Um, I do also think sometimes we don't do them well. Um, and I think we need to, to own that if that's the case um, and to really be intentional moving forward. Um, I think the church typically is founded in a lot of grace and love and support. And that is so perfect um, when we're talking about uh, people coming from trauma and hard places. That's exactly what they need is a place with unconditional support and love and community. Um, and the modeling and teaching compassion that we do. Um, I know certainly for me and my youth group, even just my modeling how I handle um, behaviors and needs and different children um, has been contagious and my youth are now sort of doing the same things for each other and showing this really, um, we call it radical hospitality, but this sort of um, how can I meet your needs and really make sure you're okay. Um, and so for me, that's wonderful to see that that, that spreads not just to the adults, but to the, the youth as well. Um, and so much understanding for each other. And like Keith had touched on earlier, we really, if we're coming from a place where we look at, you know, behaviors and um, that sort of thing as a, a moral failing or a moral choice, I know I hear that a lot with addiction, um, but I also hear that a lot with um, some of the behaviors that my, my kids show us, you know, oh, he's just being uh, defiant and willful those sorts of things, um, to really reframe that for ourselves and then also for our congregations. Um, I think about some of my children with special needs and, you know, the, the older folks in the corner who are shooting them the death stare um, from the pew over and thinking, how could we engage that person so that they can understand where this child is coming from and be one of those healthy people for them? How can we make sure that we're reframing that so that we're all, um, able to be in community together and not just annoyed by the choices this child is making or frustrated that the youth leaders not um, got them more in control. Um, so I think that's one of the things I've done too is really enlisting 
congregation members to to be part of this, we call it a therapeutic web of people who support um, the, the child. And I always like this one too, of just reframing, you know, mental health issues or emotional or behavioral health issues to just health issues. Um, we had a little girl join our church who uses a wheelchair and very quickly we realized our building was not um, appropriate for her to get in and out safely and we put in a lift and we made all the accommodations but sometimes when it's a child who's maybe defiant or unruly or just um, hard to get along with we're not as quick to make those same accommodations as we might be for a child um, who's using a wheelchair or something more visible um, and so really just looking at this as you know a holistic health challenge. How can we help this child be their healthiest, happiest self? Um, and there are so many creative ways to adapt church and adapt the environment to really um, meet the needs of this population. Um, some things I've done in my youth room have been so simple and made such a difference. I have a child who absolutely cannot sit to listen. She's a disaster if I ask her to sit still. But if she stands in the corner, She's brilliant, she's on it, she can just kind of shift back and forth. So she stands in the back of the room every time she's there. And you know what, no one's ever even asked about it because we're all just so used to what she's doing. We got some bungee cord chairs for the wiggly people and they know who they are and they go right to those chairs and they make it work. Um, I have a weighted blanket and for the people who maybe are getting anxious or who are just kind of checking out and not engaging, might take the weight of blanket over and just kind of say, hey, I wonder if you need this right now. Um, so always trying to build um, tools into the environment that will be helpful. We don't ever use fluorescent lights. None of my kids do well with those. So we've got Christmas lights and it's much calmer and we all feel better, myself included. Um, so just really looking at the space. Um, when I took over the program, everyone sat with their back to the door. So every time there was the tiniest noise, I had, you know, all of my kids looking out to see what was happening because so many of them are very anxious and hyper aroused. So we flipped the classroom. I sit right by the door and no one is twitching all the time anymore. It's incredible. It was a very small change that made a huge difference for them feeling safe. Um, and several of them voiced that. Um, and so I think just looking at our environment can even be a huge um, place to start. So we'll talk more about that in some of the upcoming sessions too, but just really starting to think, you know, for yourself, how are we making sure people feel safe um, before they even know that they're safe, just that physically feeling safe and comfortable. Um, all right. And finally, I think, um, again, going back to our commonality as sort of these mainline Protestant churches, um, we're really, really good at the reasoning part of things. We're very academic, we're very intellectual, we're very heady, um, and we can do all of the theological debating and that sort of thing. Sometimes I'm not so sure we're as good at the sensory and the regulating and the feeling as maybe some of um, the other denominations out there who are more... Um, engaged with the music and movement and those sorts of things during worship. Um, and so just thinking about how we might build in some sensory um, inputs into our services, our programming, um, our youth spaces that really help people feel regulated. And that can be as simple as that child who stands in the back. You know, do we have spaces for people to be if the, the music is too loud inside the sanctuary and those kinds of things. Um, and once people are feeling good and feeling calm and feeling safe, how are we really intentionally building in those relationships um, and really making sure that we are that web of support um, for those individuals? And then when we've done all of that, we can do all of the things we love so much um, and being very uh, reason oriented and intellectually focused as well. And I do believe that is all I have. Nate, thank you very much. And um, you know, this has become our mantra, our therapeutic mantra, to take the complexity of brain science and genetics and uh, community strife and challenges that have been uh, not only lifetime challenges, but historical and communal challenges for people and say, first, we must regulate. 
and then we relate and then we can reason and reflect. And so it comes down to do people feel safe in their body, mind and spirit? Um, do they feel like their needs are met? Do they feel accepted and loved and valued in our presence and in our programs and in our polity and in our theology and in um, the daily life? of the church and if so that will translate into their daily life and also into their discipleship so um you know sometimes when we face people with, with uh, physical challenges or mental health challenges or emotional challenges we want that quick healing that road to damascus uh instant conversion experience where everything is fixed but it's a long road that requires a lot of grace and a lot of patience and uh, being in the messiness of relationship and also the blessedness of relationship with people. So I know that we've we've been very sort of theoretical and research based and gotten into the neuroscience and started to distill this down and what we can do. But in the next session, which will feature Allison Douglas, will talk about how do you take some of this understanding and this reframing and start to put it into action in the programming. So Allison, will you unmute yourself and, and come online and give people a little uh, little dose of what you're going to offer for them here in a couple of weeks? Sure. Thanks a lot, Keith and Shanae. Um, you guys have been talking, just as you said, about all of the theoretical pieces and that foundational knowledge, but I, at my core, am still just a kindergarten teacher who uh, and gets to play with kids. You still hear me? I made a power surge. Yeah. We Great. Okay. Everything went black for a minute. Um, so I will be spending um, our time together talking about how we can put the, these theories into practice. So when we talk about sensory activities, what might that look like in your Sunday school class? What might that look like in your um, youth group? And how can we work with uh, kids and families to make sure that they get those needs met? Allison, thank you so much uh, for uh, that introduction for how you're going to take all this and help us all make sense of it. Uh, so there's your next session on August the 13th with the teacher Allison and then August the 27th. Uh, Shanae will be back in Kendall Acres, who's also one of our therapists and our, our clinical training director here. Um, we want to leave just a little bit of space. We don't have much for any questions, thoughts, concerns, uh, resources we can pass on to you. So you could put any questions in the chat box if some of you need to leave. Thank you so much for being here. I um, hope you will come back for the next session when it becomes in pragmatic and how we use this information. Uh, and if there's something we don't get to either in the chat, uh, resources you're looking for, here's my email address, Keith at HarmonyFamilyCenter.org. You can feel free to email me. Um, and if it's a question for Sinead or Allison, I'll be glad to pass that along to them. So just want to check in the chat box to see if there's any questions. Um, Says this is training recorded so we can share with others. Yes, it has been recorded. So you can contact, uh, is it you, Laura, or uh, Susan to get the recording? Yes, and we will make that available. Um, it, it'll probably take a week or so, but, uh, but we will post that on our website as soon as we get it in a, a good form. Okay, great. Any other questions or thoughts? All right, I don't see any coming in. I know we're at the end of our time. So again, Laura and Susan, thank you all for setting this up and for this opportunity. It's uh, a goal of ours, as I said, to get this information out from the clinical work we do to support the community. 
in the work they do. That's where the healing is going to come from. And uh, we firmly believe that the faith community is, as Sinead said, well, uh, well placed uh, to do that in the community. So, or back over to you. Thank you all again so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks and feel free to invite others. Even if they weren't able to be here today, we would love to have you join us in the future. And like I said, we will uh, send out some more information with the um, recording of this and, um, and then reminders about the upcoming, um, the next two in this series. So again, thank you. And we sure thank you, Keith and Shanae. Wonderful, super helpful. And we look forward to hearing from Alice. Allison in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.